Have you ever walked away from a Studio Ghibli film feeling weirdly productive? Suddenly had the urge to scrub the floor, or fold some laundry, or the put together a nice meal? It's a bit special. Or am I just some ceaseless virgin without a fun bone in my body? Probably the latter. Ghibli, for a long time, has focused on expressing the beauty in the mundane. Be it the cooling touch of a refreshing breeze, the clacking of sandals against a wooden floor, or the steam rising off a delicious meal, Ghibli has long since mastered the romanticism of daily life. Why? Well, because it's satisfying to watch. Because it makes the dopamine flock to your brain, and creates this unique association with these films in your mind. It makes you feel at home there in that setting, makes you desperately want to go there, try the food, explore, and maybe even stay long term. It's nice. For many members of this bleak generation, it sounds like an amazing eventuality to one day maybe own a house, or have time to cook a meal after work, whilst actually staying fit and healthy. It's a unique feeling that so many other films struggle to achieve, one that is strictly Ghibli, and it's often hard to put a finger on why it's so nice. Remember the scene from My Neighbour Totoro, wherein the titular neighbour and his new friends raise their umbrellas up and down? It's adorable, cute, it puts a smile on your face. He's only raising an umbrella up and down, but he's a fluffy little cushion, and it's precious. You can see how much he's enjoying it, playing with this leaf like a cat batting at a hoodie drawstring. I could watch this all day, you'd probably say. Well, okay then. But now imagine that in order to unlock the next few minutes of the film, you need to actively watch those few seconds ten times in a row. And I'm not saying that you need to leave them running ten times in a row while you go elsewhere, no. You need to watch the scene, then press a big button that says, watch this scene again. And you need to do that ten times until you've unlocked the next few minutes of the film. Now let's imagine every twenty minutes, you need to watch this scene or another similar one ten times over to be able to unlock another twenty minutes of film over and over until the film is finished. Now, continuing this train of thought, stay with me. Imagine that you have to watch this film every single day. Occasionally you might be allowed to watch a different film, but on the whole, it's My Neighbour Totoro and it's every single day, and every 20 minutes you have to sit and press that big button to progress. Every single day, clicking through those scenes that once seemed so satisfying to watch, but now hinder progress to a film that you maybe actually don't care that much about watching anymore. The scenes that you earn the right to watch by doing the mindless busy work start to lose their appeal, become just as much of a slog as the chores required to earn them. As time goes on, the dopamine injection you get from both the satisfying scene and the scene you earn as a result drops and peters out. The intensity of the sensation whittles away until you're just laying there, ashamed, fed up, and maybe even a little bit chafed. How long do you think it would take you to stop sitting through that film every day? Weeks? Months? or even just a few days. Why is this relevant, you might ask? Because Animal Crossing makes these giblified moments mandatory and unskippable. Unstackable. Every single precious moment this game has created, every simple pleasure it can portray, it will grab you by the scruff of the neck and force you to sit through it in its entirety. Every single time. No option to skip them or stack the options, no multiple crafting, no behind the scenes loading, no. You will sit quietly and you will enjoy these moments every single time as though you're viewing them for the first time. This creates a stark contrast between the tone that the game is trying to set and the actual gameplay. The philosophy of Animal Crossing is as such. Animal Crossing wants you to achieve your island dreams. You can craft whatever you want, design beautiful elaborate islands, and change the land beneath your feet to suit your will. You're an artist, a leader, a tailor, an architect, a terraforming god, and the possibilities are endless. The gameplay of Animal Crossing wants you to humble yourself and reassess your expectations. The gameplay of Animal Crossing expects you to be a sweet little cottage core islander, quietly making do on the bounties of nature, taking only what you need and nourishing the land as you go, humbly and gratefully assembling simple fragile tools, swapping recipes with neighbours, and crafting occasional bespoke items. If this game was a real person, it would accuse ketchup of being too spicy. Where the philosophy of this game and the actual gameplay of this game collide is in the expectations of play. Money and nook miles, currency earned for doing daily tasks or completing the same simple activities over and over and over again, like some woeful NPC, are mandatory for any activity you wish to partake in. You need to pay your mortgage, you need to visit other islands to meet and recruit your dream villagers, you need to shop locally and often to encourage shopkeepers to settle and upgrade their stores, you need to donate to the museum, and you also need to craft or purchase items for the islands to improve the lives of your current villagers. You see, Animal Crossing encourages you to be your best Instagram hustler. How? Because you gotta grind it out. 
You are, for some reason, the sole schmuck responsible for improving the island. You plant all the flowers and trees. You rinse all the rocks for cash, like going penny rustling under the sofa cushions. You make all the museum donations, and you sit patiently through all the blithering insect and fish discussion. You design all of the clothing patterns. You fund all of the public works in their entirety, while your villagers contribute little to nothing. Without your constant direct input and consistent cash flow, the progress and improvement of your island comes to an absolute screeching halt. It even deteriorates. Nothing is built, the shops and other facilities never settle or upgrade, the museum stays empty, your villagers just stumble about drunkenly on this slowly overgrowing island, weeds popping up out of the ground at their feet, crying out for you to come back so you can build a nice wooden bridge or maybe a bench under that tree over there. If you want to even begin dressing all of these needs, you need to be doing much more than just dancing through the flower beds. You need to grind. To highlight a really key example of this expectation, money, or bells, even in the hundreds of thousands, is quickly hoovered up by mortgage payments, island betterment purchases, and your basement museum of antique dolls. To offer an example, let's say you want to move your house one space to the left to make room for a new slope you wish to build. You can't move your house one square to the left because the game claims that there is no space to move it, because the house you wish to move is already in that space. This means that to move your home one spot to the left, you need to pay 50,000 bells up front to move it completely out of the way, and then pay another 50,000 bells to move it to the spot you needed it in the first place. A hundred thousand bells to move your house one space to the left because of some arbitrary ruling that you can't let the new placement for your house be close to the current placement for your house. I don't know what kind of grift that fellow nook is running, but if you're terraforming your island, moving everybody around to create your dream layout, and you have a full island of villagers, a museum, a town hall, and goodness knows what else, you are looking at hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of bells. So let's say you want to remodel your island and you don't want to spend six months doing Doing it. How do you plan to do this? You can net bugs, most of which net, if you'll pardon the pun, you a very measly sum. You can sell fossils on the basis that the museum already has a duplicate, because the first always goes to blathers. Or you can fish, just to name a few examples. Fishing is one of the most efficient ways, sorry, to earn money in Animal Crossing. Fishing for an hour might net you 50,000 bells depending on your luck and location, but when it costs 50,000 bells to move a local attraction, your home or your neighbour's home, and you want to have your remodel finished sometime in the next 20 years, you're going to need to get creative. Most of the rarest fish, such as the coelacanth, appear under very specific circumstances, be it time of day, season or weather. The coelacanth, for example, appears only during rain and can usually be recognised by its shadow, as it is the largest fish size in the game. Do you know what else has the largest fish shadow in the game? The sea bass. No wait, it's a C plus. These words will follow you throughout your time in Animal Crossing. No, they will haunt you. For every 30 large fish you manage to hook, maybe one will be a coelacanth. The rest will be sea bass, flapping frustratingly out of the ocean to come to rest in your character's arms. They seem so happy every time. How? Why? Why do you want this fish? Why are you so delighted to get this fish? Why are you showing me this fish again as though you're showing it me for the first time? Stop shoving your sea bass down my throat. And you'll be sat there keenly aware that the rain can stop at any moment, knowing that every second you spend button mashing your way through another no way it's at least a C plus is another second wasted. Hours and hours of time can be spent fishing in the rain to no avail, just hooking the same disappointment over and over, watching your character excitedly hop up and down with their sea bass day in and day out, charging back to the shop with a bag full of sea bass, unloading them on Tommy and Timmy for a fraction of the price of the coelacanth, you wish for a better way. And there is a better way, fish bait. Super rare fish can be more easily snagged with the use of fish bait, a craftable item that requires a single manila clam. These clams are easily found, they can be dug up out of the sand on your beach, recognised by the slight shadow they cast and the way the breeze slightly brushes over them. Unfortunately, these clams don't stack in your inventory and seem to feel justified in taking up the same amount of space as a watering can. Why can I not fill my watering can with clams? I haven't watered a flower since April. You trundle home with your fat sack of clams and begin working on crafting yourself, depending on your inventory content and size, between 20 to 40 bags of fish bait. You do this one by one. 
Every single time you want to craft another fish bait, you press that big red button and watch the cutscene play out. You scroll to the fish bait, select the fish bait, confirm that you want to create a fish bait, you watch the cutscene wherein your character crafts the fish bait, then your character proudly hoists the fish bait up and announces the newly crafted fish bait. Wow, I'm saying fish bait so much that it hardly sounds like a real word anymore. Trust me, you'll understand. You'll understand when you try the game. Anyway, once it's crafted, you're asked if you want to craft another item, at which point the cycle begins again, up to 40 times. Also, fish bait doesn't stack. Despite the fact that it's the same size as a bag of seeds, it takes up separate slots in your inventory like some big selfish lump. Honestly, I can understand if a user wants to maintain this giblified image. If they want to relish the mundane and enjoy every day-to-day -day activity, if someone enjoys watching the animations play out in their entirety, if someone enjoys crafting singular items instead of multiple, then that's fine. That's a personal choice and it's also a choice of the developer to code it in that way with those intentions. I've seen a lot of people say, if you don't like it, don't play the game. And I do agree. But surprise surprise, this is off-putting to most and does often cause people to stop playing. This insistence that you stop and smell the roses every two seconds and watch some inane animation play out for the thousandth time before you're allowed to carry on having fun, that you you have to painstakingly craft each individual item instead of multiple for the simple reason of, well because we've made it this way so you have to enjoy it, exactly as we intend it. It doesn't appeal to most, and considering the sales made by Animal Crossing at the beginning of quarantine, the fact that any Nintendo Switch was almost impossible to track down, selling on eBay for double or triple their cost in this crazy console shortage of 2020, it's almost mad that Nintendo made it such a difficult game to enjoy long term, made it so off-putting to anybody except the most die-hard fan. Another fruitful or vegetable full way of building your bank is by buying and selling turnips. Turnips can be bought on Sunday morning before noon from an NPC called Daisy May. If you mass purchase loads of these puppies and check on what is essentially a stock market throughout the week, you can sell the turnips back to Tommy and Timmy and make a huge profit. Or the price will plummet and you can either decide to cut your losses and put them in the bin, or look to greener pastures and find a friend or stranger's island to sell them on. You see, everyone has a different turnip price on their island per half day before noon and afternoon the prices will vary. This means that if it's Sunday afternoon your turnips are selling at 42 bells each and you're wondering how to declare bankruptcy with the most dignity you can instead go over to a friend's island where turnips are selling for 250 bells a piece and turn your situation around. There are entire communities dedicated to this sharing of turnip prices where people can post their dodo code, the code required to visit their island, and have members of the community come along bringing their hard-earned turnips with them. Now I have a lot to say about the island's online features as it is but I will We'll save that for later, because we need to talk about the insidious turnip extortion phenomenon. You see, money is so hard to come by in Animal Crossing that those with the more discerning daily turnip prices were able to start applying some serious leverage. Turnips are selling for 600 bells each on your island, and you've got thousands of desperate people on Twitter urgently needing to sell theirs. You can ask for whatever you want. You will be balling by nightfall. 20 Nook Mile tickets, someone will be desperate enough to provide. 500,000 bells, no worries they'll make that back and then some. Rare or limited edition furniture? It won't be rare anymore. Most people ask for all three. Scrolling through Twitter threads for 500 plus bell turnip prices, you will find reams of demands from discerning island owners, promising to kick and ban any user that doesn't provide all the requirements, to the point that it would be barely breaking even to enter their island in the first place. On the other end of the spectrum, you'll find the virtue signalers, the people who brag loudly and graciously about how they would never charge anything for island entry. But then, obviously, they can't resist mentioning how much they were given in tips by thankful visitors, showing screenshots full of donated bells, nook mile tickets, and furniture. It's the same extortion, just a different tactic. People are so desperate to make a buck off their turnips that they will throw whatever they need at you to be allowed access to your island. And in doing so, you can make a very lucrative business as long as you keep an eye on your turnip prices. Many people have criticised this, and in a vacuum, this is a fair criticism. But what most people fail to understand is that this type of play is encouraged by the game. In a situation where money and Nook Mile tickets are paramount and grinding serves as the only surefire way to get what you need and the quantities you need it, your turnips are a golden ticket to achieving some of the more basic goals of the game in a timely manner. If you have 40 people come by your island over the course of an afternoon and you demand or politely and humbly request those items from each of them, you could be sitting on millions of bells, hundreds of Nook Mile tickets and all the furniture you could ever need in exchange for simply hosting other players. You don't even 
even need to buy any turnips yourself. You just keep an eye on the market and tweet your dodo code whenever your turnip prices are high enough to be worthwhile. Either by charging for entry or humbly requesting tips, you'll have a lucrative time just by leaving your switch turned on and idle for a few hours. People complain about the greed of other players, and yeah, that is a fair comment. It's shitty to extort other players for their hard-earned money in Nookmile tickets, but the game is pulling the strings here. Turnips are the fastest and really the only way to get rich quickly, so you will do anything to sell at the best possible price. But people know this, and also needing to get rich quickly, they will hold it over other players. You either die an honest player, or you live long enough to see yourself demand 10 Nookmile tickets for a 400 bell turnip price. The inflation of the game's currency functions in such a way that it expects you to grind. It encourages mass production and mass collection, but does everything it can to prevent this from being possible. This only serves to drastically multiply the time you spend in game, doing banal tasks for the sake of incrementing your bank account by the tiniest percentiles to achieve things that, as soon as you've achieved them, pale in the face of the next achievement. Animal Crossing is like those mobile games based completely around clicking the screen. Just tap the screen over and over again for hours and hours and hours and watch the numbers go up. Imagine if My Name is Mayo took 400 hours to complete. This is the level of engagement we're talking about. You never build upon your production means, you never unlock the ability to stack items or produce multiple items, you never upgrade your facilities in such a way that you can outsource small money making tasks or island maintenance, such as weeding or fruit collection. You just sit there all day, tapping that mayo jar until the pretty costumes unlock. Every single day you log in and spend an hour or so doing your basic tasks. You weed the town, collect the fossils, collect the fruit, speak to all your neighbours, find the money tree, plant a couple trees and flowers, water them, check in with blathers, catch some fish, and pay a small amount towards an outstanding home loan. On the basis that you have a free day, you could then actually start having some fun. Maybe Flick or CJ are around to give you tasks. Maybe you can grab some thus far uncollected fish, fossils and insects and take them to Blathers. Maybe you can do some terraforming and pretty your island up. Maybe Red will be in town. Maybe there's an event with a unique NPC like that weird Easter bunny thing. Maybe you'll just fly out to some mystery island, completely deforest it, rudely snub the villager you find there because they're a bit ugly, punch some rocks and bring back your spoils to the island to either sell or craft more items. But what if you work a full-time job in real life? Maybe you leave the house at 8am and get home between 6 and 7.30pm. Maybe you need to cook yourself a meal and do some chores. Maybe you need to get an early night. Maybe you don't want to dedicate your every waking moment to some fictional island and want to spend a bit of time doing exercise or seeing friends. This means that you're constantly treading water in that first single hour of play. Day in, day out. Coming home from a monotonous, boring full-time job to spend an hour doing monotonous, boring tasks and having to turn off your switch before you can do any of the fun things that the game allows you to do. Just clocking in, completing your daily chores, and clocking out. And the more you sit there, knackered after a full day at work, logging in to Animal Crossing to just have another few hours at work, the more it starts to really dawn on you that this is the height of time wasting. This stubborn fixation on forcing the player to experience every second of content this game has to offer, this refusal to prioritise what is essential and what isn't, is extremely backwards in New Horizons. Let me draw your attention to tools. Animal Crossing New Horizons returns with all the same tools of previous instalments. You have the fishing rod, the watering can, the bug catcher to name a few, all identical to the prior games except in one key department. These tools break after a certain number of uses. A surprisingly small number of uses actually. Moreover, the game does not tell you when a tool is about to break. There is no progress bar or durability meter in the game and so often you end up having a tool break randomly while out and about, which can be especially frustrating on mystery islands or even just when far away from any crafting bench. Many have argued that a durability meter would detract from the light-hearted of New Horizons. But let me tell you why they're wrong. It's because tools break after a set number of uses. Flimsy axes and such last about 40 uses, but proper axes last 100. Slingshots, bug nets and fishing rods last 30, and a watering can lasts 60 as long as you don't miss the flowers you're watering. Then the durability increase is slightly slower. The thing is, the game knows how much longer the tool has. If you count your uses, you know how much longer the tool has. Then why the vagueness? Why conceal this from me? Why take such pains to keep me in the dark when I know just as well how soon this tool will break as you do. If the tools break randomly, a durability meter doesn't need to be there, but to somehow pretend that it's some big secret and stubbornly refuse to share this information with your users, there is no reason not to. It's not a surprise when a shovel breaks, it's just an inconvenience that the developers flat out refuse to cater for or communicate properly. If a user needs to count out loud every single time they use a tool, there is something wrong. 
Honestly, the tools don't need to have finite durability. They're so easy to craft and the ingredients can be scrounged in a matter of minutes that it just becomes another needless obstacle to progress. Your shovel breaks while you're digging for manila clams. Time to spend two minutes walking back to your house, taking the necessary items out of storage, crafting another shovel or two, then placing the items back into storage, leaving your house and having to run back and carry on exactly what you were doing. The ingredients aren't scarce. You don't worry that you'll run out. You don't worry that you'll have to wait to make another. You, do, you know, you don't worry that you'll, you'll miss out on being able to take part in what this game offers, that you'll be without a shovel for an indeterminate amount of time. You just make another shovel. It's an arbitrary problem manufactured just to waste more of your time. The same obstinate refusal is exemplified in a lot of the online features. For example, Animal Crossing New Horizons allows island visitation for multiple visitors through the use of dodo codes. A user inputs your island's dodo code into their game and can now visit your island. Multiple users can pop in and out of your island as they please without needing to sit in a lobby or be invited individually. However, in some galaxy brain move, Nintendo decided to make it so that every single visitor, when entering or leaving the island, forces all other visitors to sit through long, unskippable cutscenes. When a new person arrives, you watch an extremely long arrival cutscene featuring the view from their plane window as they land, your own island creeping out below them. This animation takes about two minutes. It's unskippable and every single person on the island, both host and all present visitors, are forced to view it in its entirety. If you're in the middle of buying some Thing when the cutscene is about to begin, you will be kicked out of the interface and forced to remake your purchase afterwards. This makes island code sharing for things like turnip prices, which are different per island for this very reason, almost hair-rending to organise. I have no idea why Animal Crossing and New Horizons has such a stringent outline of how you can have fun, the hoops you have to jump through just to spend time with your friends or host other players. Sometimes you sprint to the airlines just to leave the island and walk in to find a queue of people also trying to leave, every single person having to sit through a two minute cutscene per leaving villager, interspersed with two minute cutscenes of arriving villagers. If Minecraft, a game developed by one man a whole decade ago, is capable of allowing players to just pop in and out of your game, I refuse to believe that this 2020 release, published by a multi-million dollar company, cannot implement the same kind of seamless co-op, or at least implement background loading or passive alerts, so you aren't wrenched out of whatever you're doing every few minutes to be ham-fistedly forced to sit through decades of cutscenes. This game heralds every new villager with minutes of unskippable cutscenes, but implements features like the turnip market to make it advantageous, or even encouraged, to have visitors come and go often throughout the day. The philosophy of the game wants you to savour the occasional visitation. The gameplay wants you to have people coming and going frequently to maximise your in-game currency. Studio Ghibli gets away with this slow, methodical demonstration of everyday tasks because they take place rarely, they're unique every time, and they are there to tell a story. Films are short experiences, they're roughly 90 minutes in comparison to your classic 40 hour game, and they require no input from the user, no effort to progress. It can be hard to describe a scene in a film with the limited time you have, and watching a character interact with the scenery in a way that is pleasant and enjoyable to watch is an excellent way of setting the tone and atmosphere of a scene without needing to force exposition. Ghibli is great at showing, not telling, and even their most prolonged silent scenes are rich with detail and character. You sit back and you enjoy the experience the film offers, at the pace the film offers. Ghibli films don't go out of their way to waste your time with several minutes of these scenes unless they are 100% necessary to the story. Every shot informs the context and atmosphere of a world you only briefly glimpse, and flashes it out instantaneously to create something that feels tangible and real. Users are passive actors in a film. They don't need to act upon it to help it progress and so they must be led through the experience. The better a film does this, the more enjoyable a film is. With video games, however, a user-led experience, visuals fall by the wayside in the face of poor usability. If a game is boring to play, people won't play it. If a game is frustrating to play, people won't play it. If a game is difficult to play, as in your goals are needlessly difficult to achieve, people won't play it. The more friction you put between yourself and your user, the more loyal a user must feel to that game to overcome Come that friction. When the barriers to entry in a game are just how much time can we waste before you give up, then it is not a good game. You can polish a turd, but it will still stink, and no amount of pretty graphics or cutesy neighbours will make up for a game that purposefully makes itself a slog to play. And those weren't even all the glaring problems, only larger examples of major usability problems. The game is plagued with a myriad of hostile usability design experiences, seemingly put there just to frustrate you. You can't store multiple items at once, you have to manually 
manually click and store individual items. You can't see the value of items in your inventory, even if you've already sold them. You can't access the crafting materials that you keep in storage. You have to go to your house, withdraw them from storage, then you can use them to craft, even if you have a crafting table inside your house. Then you have to return them to storage one by one. Just searching Animal Crossing quality of life on Google will net you a slew of search results. Some poor fellow even made an Animal Crossing quality of life update video, showcasing all the updates that would make this game bearable in the long term. The demand is clearly there, and honestly, this obstinate refusal to accommodate basic quality of life only limits the player base. I know that there are hardcore players of the franchise who will stay loyal no matter what. I know that there are wholesome cottage cores who will sit through every animation out of sheer love, or Stockholm Syndrome. And I know that there are people who suffer through it for the things that they enjoy. Maybe there's a Venn diagram of all three. But the majority of players will be turned off this game for a reason that could be avoided. It's not for bad gameplay, it's not for a lack of character or insufficient content. It's not for glitches or bugs or technical problems. It's because the game is a chore to play. It's a labour of love with an emphasis on the labour. And Nintendo could do so much more to keep people interested long term. And no, I don't think carving up the content previously included in the full release of Animal Crossing New Leaf and presenting it to your audience as though it's some amazing novel thing is a good way to do that either, even if it's Free. Give me Brewster back, goddammit. I played Animal Crossing New Horizons every day for a few weeks, and I sort of felt like I was enjoying it. That is, until one day, when I booted up my Switch with a sigh and thought, wow, if I had more money than I knew what to do with, I would pay somebody to play this for me. I'd just tell them what I want, which villagers I want, and leave them to work so I could check in every now and again and see how it's going. That thought sat with me for a few hours as I collected my fruit and crafted some fish bait. The fact that I found this to be so akin to real life labour that I genuinely considered it to be a task worth compensation, that somebody should be salaried for this. I put New Horizons down that day and never picked it up again. It made me sad, and I still look back on it sadly. It's the whole reason I've made this video. I was so excited for this game that I pre-ordered it, waiting intently for it on release day, and honestly tried to like it. I tried to build an island that I could be proud of, but it just wasted my time and bragged about it as it did so. Games usually try their best to instill false pretenses of productivity, be it through trophy or achievement systems, ranks, unlockables, collectibles, or just general in-game goals. But this game seemed to so proud proudly tout that it was grind for the sake of grind, not only forcing constant monotonous labour in exchange for incremental improvements, which I could excuse in the same way an oil painting requires a lot of work for just a mere decorative piece, but by stubbornly refusing to allow the player any leeway in the grind. For the sake of romanticising the mundane, Animal Crossing jams in its heels and stubbornly refuses to make anything easier, add any quality of life elements or any upgrades to improve production methods. You see, Ghibli does a fantastic job of making everyday work seem magical and romantic, and manages to even add a flavour of satisfaction and nostalgia. But like anything, the dopamine doesn't just flood back every time. Every time you watch that moment, the happiness you feel diminishes more and more and more, and after 40 attempts at spamming my way through the airline dialogue without messing up and having to start the whole thing again, I realised that the ghibli tinted glasses were off. It was just a chore. Thank you for watching my humble video essay. Please consider giving it a like and subscribing if you enjoyed it. I'm fairly new to video essays and would really appreciate some feedback, so thank you in advance for any comments, criticisms, and pieces of advice. And one final thanks to my patrons, who are a huge support in my ventures, and my editor, Shekel, who is a god among men. So uh, I'll see you all next time. Thank you very much.